Liberty University, how are you tonight? You doing well? Well, I just want to say before we get going that it is such an honor for me to get to introduce to you uh, at this moment our president. It is uh, just a blessing to me to know that he wanted to be here with us tonight. He wanted to worship with us tonight, uh, sit under God's teaching tonight, and uh, he gets to open us up in prayer. This is probably the first time many of you are gonna get to meet Dr. Prevo. It won't be the last. He's gonna be all over campus. He wants to meet you, have lunch with you. He and his wife are a whole lot of fun. You're gonna really love this brother in Christ. He's been a pastor for a long time. He's a true and tried, just, you know, pastor at heart. And so, I don't know about you, but I'm so grateful that he took this on in this particular season of his life. Come on, let's stand up and honor him. Let's give it up for Dr. Prevo. President Prevo, come on up. Thank you. You may be seated. We're glad you're here tonight. It's an honor for me to be here for our campus community. And by the way, you're the first group to be here in this stadium since last November. So you're an honored group tonight. You really are. Now, the next group that we hope they will be on this field is sitting right over here. And I'd like for all of our football team to stand up. Let's give them a big hand. Stand up, guys and gals. You're going to be winners this year, right? If anybody will play you <laughs> with this, thank you. With this uh, COVID situation, we're not sure how many games we're going to get to have in here. Uh, how many are here from Alaska? Anybody here from Alaska? Where are you? Stand up and I'm from Alaska. Don't be afraid of Alaska and ashamed of it. One, two, three. Where? All right. Great. How many Texans are here tonight? Stand up and holler. All right, now all you Texans better treat me right and be nice to me. What's the second largest state in the union? Hmm? Texas, right? Yeah, Alaska's the biggest. And if you Texans don't treat me right, we're gonna go back to Alaska, divide it into two states, and then Texas will be only the third largest state. I think Texas deserves that, don't you? No, Texas is a good place to be from. Uh, today I was out uh, by the big tower. I was uh, with some students there, and I wonder if they're here tonight. Are they here tonight? They better be here tonight. Where are that group? Help me look around. Where are those uh, young students that were freshmen that were out on? They better be here. Where are they? Stand up and holler. Anybody see them? Well, if they're not here, I'm going to get them. They promised me they were going to be here. I don't see them anyplace. Well, again, we're from Alaska. We're honored to be here and serve as your president now. And we're going to have an exciting time this year. We're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to have a good time. I hope that uh, you'll feel free to come up and speak to me. I saw some students today. They were kind of looking and going around. You come up and shake my hand. We'll get our picture made together and I'll let, find, try to find out your name. But I want you to meet a very special person in my life. It's my wife. She's sitting way up there. I don't know why they put her that far up. Stand up, Carol. Stand up. Come on, stand up. There she is. Let me tell you how we met. She's gonna kill me for this, all right? We, we were at last day of high school, they were all of our uh, school, the graduating class and the seniors were going to go to a park and have a big event. Me and my buddy, we were sitting out in the parking lot and we were trying to find out who are we going, what girls are we going to invite to go with us? So we sat there and all of them come out this door. We were looking this one, this one. And finally, I looked over at my buddy and I said, listen, there's two girls coming out. I think they're the last two. And uh, I looked at him and I said, you can have this one. I'm going to take this one. And this one was that little girl you see up there. And we became sweethearts of the sophomore year. And we've been married now 56 years. She's put up with me. <laughs> Glad to see you here tonight for Campus Community. Of course, you realize why we can't uh, 
fill this thing up, which we probably would have, uh, almost fill it up. And uh, one girl I was talking to today uh, out the lawn, she said, I didn't register in time. I can't go tonight. And uh, I thought maybe I could slip her in. In fact, I see an empty seat or two down there. I should have brought her anyway. Well, I hope you're here tonight to worship the Lord and have a good time in the Lord, and I believe you are, or you wouldn't be here tonight. Let me just ask one more question. How many freshmen do we have here tonight? Stand up. This is your first year at Liberty University. All the rest of you, give them a big hand. Thank you. Now, I want to encourage you to do this. When you see a student out walking by themselves, I want you to go up to them and say, what's your name? Because some of you are new here tonight, you don't have any friends yet. And I want you that have friends, when you see a student by themselves and it looks like they don't have any friends with them, that you'll and introduce yourself and be a friend to them. Can I, can I expect you to do that? All right. If, you, if I can expect you to do that, give a big hand tonight, would you please? All right. Let's bow our heads together tonight. For word of prayer, I want to pray for each of you. I'm so glad you chose Liberty University. You're going to have a wonderful experience. We're going to train you to be a champion in your vocational field. But more important than that, we're going to train you to be the spiritual leader and connecting with the Lord Jesus Christ and be a champion Christian. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Lord, tonight we thank you for loving us. Dear God, we thank you for sending your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into this world to die on the cross to pay for our sins. And then, Lord, we thank you that you came out of that grave alive and victorious over death. And we know that when death maybe comes to our grandparent, maybe to a mom or dad, to maybe a brother or sister who are believers, that they are going to be with you and we're going to get to see them again. We know some students here tonight who've lost some precious loved ones, and we just pray that you put your arms around them tonight and bless them. Thank you for Pastor David. Thank you, Lord, for his team. And, Lord, I pray that you would use him tonight to challenge all of our hearts. Help us, Lord, to go forward here at Liberty University. You've got great things in store for all of these students that are here tonight. And, Lord, as I look out across this audience tonight. Lord, I see a great potential, and I just hope that they'll all dedicate themselves to become a champion for Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. Let's worship tonight. Good evening, campus community. Would y'all stand up with us tonight and worship?
your mercy never fails me all my days i've been held in your hands from the moment that i wake up until i lay my head i will sing of the goodness of god when we sing to him this that all my life you have been faithful. Lift this up, this is your song. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I love your voice.
his hands, his feet, my Savior, thy cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance he by heavy stones, Messiah still and all alone. This is a song of victory we sing. Oh, praise the lift it up of the
Let's declare this together. Come on, chains. Chains fall, fear bow here and now. Jesus, you change everything in lives. Heal hope found here and now. Jesus, you change everything in change. in just a second, but uh, before we sing that chorus, uh, let's just go before the Lord and um, just ask him that tonight in this moment, that the glory of God, the weight of God, the kabod of God would be manifest. Just asking him that tonight in this uh, football stadium, tonight in, in dorms that are watching, tonight all across the nation, parents that are tuning in, alumni, people that love us and have been praying for us in this season would just in their own space, in their own home, in their own lives, not just audit something from away, but that they would see the glory of God fall in their life. And that this moment won't be about inventory about what's happening here, nearly as much as it's an inventory of what's happening here. We're asking God to do something. So let's just come before him. So Jesus, we pray that your glory that your person, that you would make yourself known to us. We love that in scripture, we see where it says, but we'll study tonight, that the glory of God was made known. It was shown for all. All the prophecies of old about the coming glory came born in a manger in such humble posture. And tonight, 2,000 years later, we look back and say, that same Jesus, humble Jesus, victorious Jesus, powerful Jesus, is the same Jesus we need in the stadium. It's the same Jesus we need on our campus. It's the same Jesus we need in our state. It's the same Jesus we need in our nation. It's the same Jesus we need in this world. And so show your glory to us tonight. Let's just sing that, let's just pray that. Come on, ask him to make his glory known in your life at this moment. Just welcome him in. Come on, sing that together. Show us your glory, show us your glory. In wonder and surrender we fall down. Show us your glory, show us your glory. Show us your glory, show us your glory. In wonder and surrender we fall down at your feet, Jesus. Show us your glory, show us your glory. Let every burning heart be holy ground. 
And so that is our prayer tonight, that Jesus, you would be made known to us and that through everything that we're talking about, Jesus, you would come front and center. We pray this every time we come together on a Wednesday, that Jesus, you would be the great speaker tonight, that when we open your word that's living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting through bone and marrow and judging the attitudes of life, that we would say that is about your mercy, your glory coming into our lives tonight and telling us the truth, even if it's hard to hear. I pray that tonight, in this very moment, that you would give me uh, discernment to know what to say, what not to say, where to go in Scripture and stay longer, where to just... Um, punctuate a thought that's not even in the notes. And so will you just tonight, God, in this very moment, uh, just be our great leader. You be the wind in the sails and take us, God, where, um, where you want us to go in this place. We need you now, God. All we've got is lights and sound and, and chairs and, and um, all of this cannot manifest your presence. And so we just need you. We just need you now, God, to come through it all. We pray this in your name. Amen. So uh, before we open God's Word, you may have a seat. Thank you. Um, before we open God's Word tonight, um, I have two things I want to uh, talk to you about um, before we get into the passage. Uh, I'm preaching tonight to you uh, out of a passage that's about the glory of God being made known, also out of Romans 6, 1 through 3 as well. But before we unpack God's Word tonight, I, I wanted to read something to you, uh, and I also wanted to make sure uh, in reading this to you that you knew who our intended audience is, who our intended audience is, because I think tonight there are probably reporters watching this, this being our first big gathering, that probably aren't a part of our culture, maybe even don't share our faith. There are people that are watching tonight that um, are people that have been early stakeholders here at Liberty University, people that graduated out of the very first class in 1971. And there may be somebody who is a incoming senior this year who's considering the school. And as they're considering the school, they're thinking, what all is happening? When I Google the school, a lot of things come on the internet and I'm just wondering if this is the place God wants for me. And so whatever angle you're in, I, I wanna make sure that uh, you feel welcome as you're in this moment with us, but at the same time that you know uh, who our intended audience is. And then of course, uh, I wanted to also read to you uh, something that is very personal. This was really the beginnings of my morning journal. Uh, and I was just kind of writing some things out this morning and uh, this afternoon. And I just eventually thought, you know, why don't I just read this for our family here? And so I'm going to read this to you, and after I read it to you, we'll pray, and then we'll begin the, the message part, which is typically what I do on a Wednesday night. I come out here after we have worship, and we have prayer, and then, you know, we unpack God's Word. We'll do that here in about five or six minutes, if you don't mind. But let me read this to you, um, if you don't mind. This is, this is personal here. In the last few years, campus community has grown to become one of the largest Bible studies in the world. And with that, obviously, comes guests. On any given week, there are faculty, staff, alumni, board members, parents, and others who are with us, and certainly they're Liberty family, but they join us knowing that this gathering, from its worship style, to its graphics that we use, to its sermon, it's obviously not aimed at them. We're glad you're here, but campus community is not made with a professor in mind. It's not made with a board member in mind. They're certainly not excluded from its truth, but this moment right here is aimed at you, the Liberty student, and that's why we build what we build. It's our Bible study. If you've joined us on Wednesday nights in the past, you know that I preach to our students at the end of tonight, when I go to bed, I have to put my head on my pillow and ask God, God, what did you think of tonight? Was I faithful to you and your word in the way that I preached it to these students? Tonight is not gonna be any exception. Liberty students, where are you at, Liberty students? Liberty students, this is for you. This is for you. I'm excited that we have guests speaking in. I'm, I'm thrilled that people are joining us, but this 
is for you. I am here for you. I love you. And as long as God has me here, has my family here, I'm committed and honored to be your campus pastor. I've been praying, studying, and preparing all summer uh, for a new sermon series uh, with you in mind. I can't tell you how many hours I have spent in, in, in theology books. I can't tell you how many hours I've spent on my knees preparing to launch this season uh, for you. And I can't wait for God to do what he's going to do. And I believe this is probably going to be the most important series that we've ever done. Next week, I'll be able to tell you why uh, and how this series came about in the first place. It's also important to note that I'm really aware how tonight um, will also leave some of you, both the students that are here, who this is for, and some people that are peeking in or joining us as guests. I realize that tonight is going to leave some of you disappointed and angry. There are those who have told me to lay low and to not mention any of the things that lead to Jerry Falwell's resignation yesterday. Those who prefer to move on immediately, erase his name from everything around here, and would rather not talk about him. Obviously, if that's you, I just said his name. So you're already thinking, I've blown it, and I'm going to disappoint you. There are those who want Jerry mentioned, but only in the manner of grace, only in the lane of grace, mentioned only if the Bible verses around this are pertaining uh, forgiving one another, grace being sufficient and not casting the first stone. They fear that anything past that in this moment will look and feel unforgiving and harshly judgmental. And if that's you, I've got a feeling you're going to be pretty disappointed in tonight. And then, of course, there are those who want to only talk about Jerry Falwell tonight. It's not enough to say that the truths of God's Word uh, were, uh, that we are going to study tonight apply to all of us, including him. They want us to, to pick every illustration and to explicitly make it about Jerry Falwell tonight and his wife and his former staff and the board and said in a manner that is condemning and shameful. No matter what I say and how much I say about him, they're probably not going to be happy because he won't be enough or long enough or blunt enough or hard enough. And I'm probably going to let you down if that's why you're here. If you're looking for me to punch this man down, his family down, I'm not doing that and you're not going to be happy. But if you're looking for me to tell you only about all the great things that he's built and the new heights that his hard work and dedication, true hard work and dedication brought to us, I'm not going to do that alone either. So since neither side is going to be satisfied, and I'm okay with that, and have been for a long time, let's pray and ask that many of us tonight who are more in the middle camp will come to this moment asking God for grace and truth, for both honor and honesty, not having to lay one down to be able to pick up the other. And so, don't get me wrong. You're right if you want to hear extravagant grace and forgiveness. And you're also right to want to see stern and swift, accountable action for sinful behavior. But if you're here with only one thing in mind, then I do ask that at least while I'm speaking tonight, that you hear me out before you start calling it too condemning or too condoning. Now, a more personal note just from me. This, this moment that we're in is a mess. Let me begin by saying to you, let me, this is a personal moment here, begin by saying to you, I am sorry. In my opinion, you as a Liberty student deserve better. And the embarrassment that's been brought upon you as a Liberty student, and more importantly, brought upon the name of Christ, is wrong. I know that many of you are hurting, and that breaks my heart. Your concerns, if you're concerned, are valid. If you're not concerned, you should be concerned. And so your concerns are valid. You and your family have worked hard to pay for a Christian education, and this wasn't what you signed up for. I heard from one of you that you hesitated wearing your Liberty t-shirt this summer because you did not want the more recent baggage that came with it. And it just shouldn't have been 
that way. So let me be the first to say to you, if no one else has, and to personally apologize by saying, I am sorry, not on behalf of anybody else but me. Liberty is more than a college. We know that, right? Liberty is more than a college. Let me just say that again. Liberty is more than a college. We are God's college. And as our founder always said, if it's Christian, it ought to be better. Certainly better than this. Certainly better than this. A year ago this time, when we were kicking off our very first campus community last year, a year ago this time, the Office of Spiritual Development, which I get to be a part of, but I get to be a part of the team of, had perhaps grown to be the most diverse office in all of Liberty. This has been a really intentional part of the way that we grew our leadership when we reimagined and relaunched spiritual development four years ago. But I lost this summer several African-American staff members who I love and think so highly of. One of them this summer told me that after he saw Governor Northam's blackface mask posted, he knew that he could no longer work here at Liberty University. I asked him to reconsider, but after he said no, I also told him that I love him and that I understood and respected his choice. I believed that he was being obedient to what God was calling him to do personally. After we got off the phone, I'll just be telling you that uh, after we got off the phone, I just started crying. I'll never forget, I was sitting on vacation when he, when he called me. So I just got off the phone with him and it just, it just burst. I just began to just weep. And, and, and the reason was I knew that a great team member that we had had been lost. And I wept for you because I knew what a great team member was he was in leading you in spiritual development. We're going to miss him a lot. And, and I know that this is going to be a pivotal moment. And I'm, I'm sad for him and all that he's going to miss out in getting to know you as well. But it also was a moment where at the end of that time when I was weeping, I felt assured that my family was called to stay. This is also true for any other student or student athlete who might be watching tonight who felt God called them to leave. Those of us who are here love and respect you. The men on the football team, where are you at, men on the football team? We love you, all right? And I want to say this on your behalf. The men on the football team are here tonight, and they miss their former teammates. The girls from the basketball team miss their former teammate. And each and every one of us wish you nothing but the best. If God called someone who's watching tonight to not return this semester because of something that happened or something that they imagined, I mean, something that they, they, that they saw or something that they were made aware of, we want you to know that we love you and we understand. But God did tell you to leave, but in the middle of that, we want you to know something. As much as we love you, as much as we love you, this is also true that this is not gonna be a goodbye. <laughs> We are going to spend eternity in heaven together. So you're still stuck with us anyway. <laughs> Again, after a lot of prayer and consideration this summer, my family and I, while respecting the decisions of others that felt called to, to leave, knew that God was calling us to stay. After all, this wasn't the first time that we had to pray about that decision. Then this summer came to a close and we opened the semester with a series of revelation about Jerry Falwell that can only be described as shameful. That's okay, by the way, to say it. It's okay to call sin, sin. It's okay to say what Paul says in Ephesians, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret but everything exposed by the light becomes visible. Everything that is illuminated becomes a light. By the way, it's not dishonoring someone when you bring this before them. It's honoring them enough to tell them the truth. It's okay to call sin, sin. You know why? Because it is the only way to actually start to deal with it. It is not love to simply stay in the dark and not call, shameful, call what, what, not call shameful what God calls shameful. And if we're not willing to stand on that truth, then what in the world 
are we calling ourselves Christians for in the first place? And so, in this moment, even after the last few weeks, I've gotta tell you that my family and I kept praying and more and more we felt confirmed to stay. For all of us who are called to stay, for all of us who look at those who God called to go and we bless, and all of us tonight who are called to stay or to join like the 4,000 incoming freshmen and transfers, we still believe in God-given vision that was given to us in 1979. And together, we're going to make sure there were more on God's path to accomplish this vision than ever before. For as long as the Lord allows, I plan to continue to spend every bit of my influence that I have to make this place as God glorifying as I can. Again, I love you and I count it an honor that my family gets to serve alongside all of you. Again, that's from me. And I wanted to read it so that it would be crystal clear. And I wanted to read it so that you would have it. So that the next time maybe a lost friend or the next time maybe an unbelieving family member pulls up something that they saw and says, is this what Christianity is? Is this your faith? You could say, my campus pastor apologizes that we have not been all that we could be that our witness wasn't what it was supposed to be. And it's just a mess. And I'm sorry for the embarrassment that you've had to go through. If nobody else tells you that, David Nasser apologizes to you. Let me pray for us, and then we'll uh, open up God's Word. And so, Lord, we just sang, show us your glory. As now we pray what that looks like, and we come to this moment and we open up your word, we pray that your glory would be made shown to us by not just studying grace and truth as theology, not just studying it, God, for what our former president will need, but what I need. And so, Lord, let these illustrations be about my life, uh, juxtaposition them, God, up against my life. And so tonight I pray that none of us would be exempt from this. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, that both your grace and your truth are a gift. We pray this in your name. Amen. So uh, we've been in training week the last few weeks, and as we've been in training week, just getting everybody back on campus and all of our OSD team, you know, all of our community group leaders on campus, getting all of our uh, resident shepherds on campus. We've been in a lot of contexts where I've had the opportunity to, to be with some of our leadership, and just about every session that we have, we end with Q&A. We always think that uh, we sometimes are communicating and feeling like the message is getting across, but it's not, so we ought to just stop, slow down, and let people be able to ask questions for clarification. And just about everywhere that I've been in the last few weeks, uh, the one reoccurring question that's come up has been this question about just all that's been transpiring on the news. And so everybody keeps asking me, uh, you know, can you just give us some language? Honestly, I'm this way sometimes. Sometimes there are people I, I love and I look to them just not because I want to see what they think nearly as much as I kind of want to know maybe what I think. Anybody know what I mean when I say that? Like sometimes you go to a trusted author or you go to a trusted teacher of the Bible and you ultimately are going to go to God's word, but because you trust them, you want to know, can you begin to give me some language so that then I can go to God's word from that passage, that language, and, and then I can begin to form a better way to communicate what's in my heart. And so I think a lot of students not, sometimes aren't asking just so they can see what I think. They're, they're asking so that they can get permission to voice you know, what they think, or maybe get better languaging in what they think. And so my answer every single time that we've been together has really been simple. My answer has been that when it comes to the Falwell family, when it comes to anyone, when it comes to me, what I need in my life when, not if, but when I stumble, when I sin, when I do something inappropriate, when I have wronged you, when I am in that place in my life, when anyone is in that place in their life, what they need, and I know this is going to sound Jesus-jukey, but it's not. Listen to me. 
is Jesus. Here's what I mean by that. What they need in the fullness of Jesus is grace and truth. Now, I gave that answer in a couple of different settings, and we talked five minutes because it was one question that we had. But tonight, I want to take about 20 minutes and unpack that for us, and then we'll go to community groups tonight. And hopefully we'll get out of these rows, we'll get into circles, right? And we'll go a whole lot deeper with them because the app is just chock loaded with quotes and theology for you that's gonna take you deeper into this. So let's just begin by defining what grace and truth is. If you're taking notes, write this down, all right? You ready? Grace, grace is the unmerited favor of God. Grace is the undeserving love of God. Grace is the lavished, unrelenting, unstoppable tsunami of the love of God to the people that deserve exactly the opposite. Amen? Grace is the unmerited favor of God. Truth is the uncompromised standard of God. As much as God's grace is unmerited, God's truth is uncompromising. God's truth is the, is the barriers that hold God's holiness together. God is a God of holy set apart. That's how you define holy standards. And so grace is God's unmerited favor and truth is God's uncompromised standard. Another way to say it is in God, we see mercy and justice. Jesus, we're about to read here, is literally the grace and truth of God made manifest. God with us is the glory of God shown to us in grace and in truth. Let's look at our passage for tonight. John 1, 14. The word became Flesh. Now, earlier on, earlier on in John, we're told that in the beginning was the Word. Now, that Word means Jesus the Word. Not just the written Word the Bible teaches us, right, is called the Word, but the Word made flesh is called the Word. So, John gives us this glimpse how in the beginning, before there was a beginning, there was a beginner who began the beginning. The uncreated one who was there creating all of creation was Jesus, the Word made flesh. And so, in the beginning was the Word. And that, that's important because God the Father wasn't the creator, and then he created the God the Son and then rolled out God the Spirit. No, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit in the beginning were a part of creation. And so that word is who we're talking about. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen, there it is, we just sang it, his glory. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of, let's say those two words together, grace and truth. Listen, we need both of those tracks in our lives. When I say tracks, you know how a train has two tracks? With one track, it'll derail. With the other track, it'll derail. But with both tracks, it can move forward like it needs to. We need both wings. That's another way to put it. With one wing, we can't fly. With the other wing, we can't fly. An airplane is the same. With one wing, it crashes. With another wing, it crashes. With both two wings, it can soar. Does that make sense? And Jesus is both. And as God's people, we should be both. This isn't 50-50 compromise as well, all right? So I don't want you to think that Jesus is 50% grace and 50% truth. This isn't 50-50. No, as a matter of fact, the scripture right there, what does it say? The scripture says that Jesus is full of grace and truth. So Jesus is over brimming. He is full, all right? It, 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 is, it is abundantly to the very, very core, to the very, very top, every single ounce full of grace and full of of truth. And so we are called to love people as the recipients of God's grace and truth, as the recipients, not just that Jesus made himself manifest so that we can examine it, but Jesus made himself manifest so that we could partake. 
as those who have come to the fountain of grace and truth and have become filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Father, filled with Jesus Christ as our Savior. As we come to the cross and we see on the cross the, 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 the agony of sin and the glory of salvation and we bend our knees and we receive God's grace, we see that we just only receive it, but it flows out of our lives. And so we are called to love people in a way that shows that we love them just the way that they are, but we love them too much to leave them that way. You know what that means? That means grace and truth. For some of you, this is a whole lot more personal than somebody that you call your school president. For some of you, this is as personal as your own father or your own mother. Some of you know that your own best friend your very best friend, the person that is going to be in your wedding then one day, the person who's going to be at, at you know, your child's you know, baptism one day is the very person right now who's living a very prodigal life. And in this moment, it just feels like, man, I want to be Jesus to this person. And if you want to be Jesus, you got to love them just the way that they are. But if you really love them, you love them too much to leave them that way. And so we're bound to show comfort when someone is hurting and by the way, someone can be hurting because of the sins they commit, and someone can be hurting for the sins that have been committed against them, right? But when someone is hurting, whatever it might be, we are bound to try to show comfort and care, but not at the expense of condoning, not the, at the expense of celebrating the very thing that maybe brought them to that place. And so if you're taking notes, I want to make sure that you get this because I think we can rally tonight in community groups around this one essential truth. You ready? Or, or is not an option in the Christian life. Or is not an option in the Christian life. Jesus is grace and truth. Amen? Jesus is not grace or truth. Jesus is not, if you're having a really, really good day, grace comes your way. If you're having a really, really bad day, truth comes your way. Jesus doesn't go, on Monday, I'm going to ration out grace. And on Tuesday, I don't want you to get too much grace. So I'm going to ration out some truth. Jesus comes in a package. There's no separation. People that say there's this tension, get it wrong. There's no tension. These are not just even dovetailed together. They're integrated together. It's like if you bite an apple and somebody goes, well, listen, when you bite this apple, I want you to get the crunch, but I don't want you to get the calories. You go, I can't bite into an apple without getting both. I want you to get the sour, but I don't want you to get the sweet. You go, I can't bite into it without getting both. If you eat a piece of pound cake, all right, they're going, I want you to get the egg part, but I don't want you to get the flour part. You're going, man, I take a bite out of a piece of pound cake. I got to get both. Does that make sense? And so when we come to Jesus, it's not like Jesus on some days rations out and just gives away a ton of truth. And on another day, he just gives away a ton of grace. Jesus at all times, as our great example, gives grace and truth. And so if for Jesus, or is not an option, for Jesus' people, or must not be an option. See, today, the world that we live in, or sneaks in, and, and it actually looks in, in the form of tolerance more than anything else. If you want to know what it looks like, it looks like, well, that could be your truth, or this could be someone else's truth, and both can be truth. As a matter of fact, I want to say this about tolerance. Now, tolerance sounds friendly. It, it sounds like a pillow, but it's really a dagger when it comes to the things that really matter in accountability in life sometimes. Tolerance is an imposter of grace. Here's another way to say it for our community groups tonight. Grace doesn't put up. Grace holds up. One of my favorite passages in all of Scripture is Romans 6. When I first became a Christian, I was in this men's Bible study, and we memorized the entire chapter. And I remember just being explained this as a baby believer when I was memorizing it. Like I memorized the passage, but I didn't really understand the essence of it. And one of these guys was explaining it to me. And it just became one of my favorite passages because early on it became such a foundational way for me to think about grace. And it's simply this. Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means, he says. We are those who have died to sin. 
So how can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who have been baptized in Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Paul is saying the grace of God. Anybody here received the grace of God at the foot of the cross? The grace of God is not permission to sin. The grace of God is actually permission to stop sinning. Grace doesn't give you license to sin, gives you power instead to stop sinning. Does that make sense? Everything about the gospel is about the grace of God empowering us, not out of works, but out of worship, not out of duty, but out of delight to say grace has been poured in me, not so that I can go get away with whatever I want and go grace, but instead to say, I have finally due to grace, the power to live in obedience, not to earn his favor, beloved, but because we already have his favor. So the grace of God gives us that. That's why Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? That's that warped idea that the more I sin, the more there's a power for grace to like be made manifest. If you think that about grace, you've never understood grace because you've tried to take a bite out of the apple and get one part without the other. And you can't. You cannot come to Jesus and say, I want your grace, but I don't want your standard. I want your mercy, but I don't want your justice. I want just half of you. Half of Jesus makes people live a half filled life. And I got to tell you, that's just desperate. That's just desperate because you're going to have just enough Jesus to constantly be disappointed and you're eventually going to wear out. And God wants more for you and me than that. I want to read you a quote. I love this quote. I think it just says it better than I could say it. Um, it's a long quote. I don't like long quotes normally. All right. And those of you that know, like I normally get up and tell a lot of stories and we just kind of unpack a passage and I do very quick quotes for us but uh, just put up with this long quote for me because I think um, Pastor Kevin DeYoung does such a great job of just kind of um, giving this to us just in, in just rapid fire in this quote but um, and it'll, it'll be in your app tonight for uh, campus community all right let's just read this together Jesus was all grace stop right there don't read any further just put that down put that down take that away for a second take that away all right look at me do you believe that? That Jesus was all grace. Do you believe that? I want you to believe that because it is true. I want you to know that when you see Jesus, you see all grace in Jesus. He welcomed sinners and tax collectors and he ate with them. He had compassion on the crowds when they were hungry and far from home. He welcomed little children to come and sit on his lap gentler and kinder than any department store Santa. He healed the leper, the lame, and the blind. He saved the criminal on the cross who, is his, who was on his dying breath and confessed that the dying man next to him was truly the son of of God. And so before we read any further, over and over and over again, we see Jesus show grace. One of my favorite places in scripture is where Jesus comes into a moment in John 6 where he sees 5,000 people. That's how many we have here tonight. When we socially distance at every, you know, distance and we all come into this place from different entrances and we do everything we do, there's 25,000 seater seats right under 5,000. And that's what we have here tonight. And I want you to know that 5,000 people, you can look around, so it's about the room that we have here in the football stadium. About 5,000 people, all right, are gathered in a moment when they're hungry. As a matter of fact, some theologians believe it was 5,000 men, but with those men came, you know, like women and children. And this is before birth control, so think Catholic numbers, all right? So some theologians believe more like 20,000. But, I, but the more I read about it, the more I think maybe it actually was 5,000. So he goes back and forth. But at the very minimum, you've got about 5,000 people in John 6 that have come. And most of them don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They don't believe Jesus is the bread of life. They just think he's the bread giver, not the bread himself. And they come into a moment where he's, they're hungry. And what does Jesus do? They're hungry, and so he feeds them. That's an act of grace. He doesn't go, do a survey and find out who all believes I'm really God. And if they believe I'm God they get to eat. If they don't believe I'm God, they don't get to eat. 
No, Jesus finds out that there are hungry people there. And you know what he does? He feeds them. The next day, you know what he tells them? You must drink of my blood. You must eat of my flesh. That physical hunger you have is nothing but a a, a living physical illustration of the ultimate eternal hunger that you have of your soul. And the only thing that can feed you is me. So what did Jesus do? He gives grace in meeting a need. And then he bridges the gap, right? By then showing truth because he loves them too much. He loves them too much just to have the social gospel, which is no gospel at all. But you meet a need, and after you meet a need, you go, that's all people need. Listen, I don't think a lot of people take our faith seriously because they're dying of malaria because they don't have a well, and we don't care. But when we do care, it's not enough just to go build the well. We need to build the well. As a matter of fact, one of our, one of our guests is going to come here this semester. He's probably the loudest, you know, uh, just advocate for that very thing. A guy named Scott Harrison is going to come our way from Charity Water. But Scott Harrison will be the first to tell you, we don't just build the well and go, that's all there is. In the name of Jesus, we build the well. But we're not doing social work. We're not doing social justice. We're doing gospel work. And so we build the well, and when they drink, we wait, and they go, why did you just do that? Why did you just come all the way from halfway across the world and care about me? Somebody you've never met will go, because Jesus is living water. Does that make sense? We walk into the life of an orphan, and we say, you know what? We're going we're to walk into your life, and we're going we're gonna to adopt you, but it's going to be just social work. It's going to be just good things to do, good deeds to do, kind things to do if we adopt that child. But we as Christians do that so that when that person comes to the age of understanding the gospel, we can get to a place where we can share the gospel. We can say, what I can offer you by opening up my home to you is just temporary, but God wants to open up for you an eternal home so that you can be a child of God. How great is the love of the Father? Scripture says that we would be called what? The children of God. And 183 million orphans will take the gospel more seriously when we open up our homes and say, if you're homeless, that matters to me. But when they come in, guess what we do? We get to earn the right by opening up our home to say Jesus is the only one that can give you a forever home. Does that make sense? Grace and truth. He meets the woman at the well. And when he meets the woman at the well, he sits with her. He associates with her. He doesn't bring shame upon her life. He doesn't bring, you know, condemnation upon her life because she's lost. He becomes a kind person who says, I want everyone in daylight to see me with her. But by the end of the conversation, he does give her truth. His last words to her. They're his last words, not the first. He doesn't front load or go and sin no more. So I want to say this. Lost people act like they're lost because they're lost. So we always front load with tons and tons of grace. But God's people, if you call yourself a Christian, and that applies to all of us. Anybody here that call yourself a Christian, believe that Jesus Christ stepped out of heaven, stepped into your life? That applies for the Falwell family. That applies to David Nasser and his family. That applies for the professors that are here. That applies for our, our, our sitting president who's on our board, you know, Dr. Provost is here. That applies to every one of us. If Jesus lives in us, then all of a sudden, as those who claim his name, at that moment, then the expectation is God's people ought to be different from the patterns of this world. That's what it says in Romans 12, 1, that we are supposed to be conformed, right, by God, not by the world. Transformed by God, not by the world. Do not be like the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is your spiritual act of not workship, but what? Worship. Let's go back to the quote. We're almost done. And Jesus wasn't just all grace. He was also all truth. He condemned many of the religious leaders of his day for being liars and hypocrites. He talked about hell more than he talked about heaven. He called his disciples to take up their cross daily and to follow him. He prophesied judgment on Jerusalem for their unrepentant hearts. He obeyed the law. He set standards and demanded everything from his followers, even their very own lives. And so Jesus, Jesus is grace and truth, and the people of God should be grace and truth made manifest. So, in my life, when you see inconsistencies or when you see something that doesn't look like Jesus, show me Jesus. It might not be what I want to hear. It might not be popular for me. 
But a lot of times what I want to hear isn't what I need to hear. And so love me enough to give me grace and love me enough to give me truth. I love this passage. Last thought here before we kind of begin to wrap up. I love this passage. It says in John 8, 36, I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. But if the son sets them free, they can be made free indeed. What I love is that truth is actually the recipe, the first step, the catalyst of freedom. Free at last, free at last. Good Lord Almighty, I wanna be free at last. And you and I know this, the only way that I'm ever gonna find liberty is when I find it at the foot of the cross. I came here six years ago. When I came here six years ago, I came here as someone who was delivered out of Islam into Christianity. And I wanna tell you, I came here wanting to wear grace and truth on everything that I do. And people have shown that to me. They've shown grace and truth to me. I've messed up so many times in the last six years. I'll continue to mess up. I think even now these days are good days to just kind of look in the mirror and reflect and go, what are some things that maybe I wasn't seeing that I need to be really looking back on and repent from? I'm just telling you all that to say, in this moment in my life, grace and truth is just as much forefront than anything else. But I want to say this to you. I want to commit this to you that we're gonna continue to be about grace and truth in your life because we believe that what you need is grace and truth because Jesus would want it that way for every single one of us. The antidote, the solution to having liberalism is not to knee jerk and go into legalism. (laughs) And so the antidote of grace gone wrong is not for us to go to truth gone wrong. The hope for us is Jesus. Amen? So let's just pray together. Let me just pray for us. I thank you, Jesus, that you are every single bit of that in every single moment of our life. I thank you that, Jesus, that you hold us accountable. You love us too much to let bygones be bygones in our lives. And Lord, just as you did that on the foot of the cross, you didn't just let bygones be bygones for the sins that I've committed, but the crushing weight of it was on me. And I came to Jesus to plead guilty, but to plead in need, desperate. I pray that if there's anyone tonight who's hearing my voice, who has not received Jesus, they would understand that it is only offered to them grace and truth, forgiveness and mercy. It is only offered to them when they bend their knee at the foot of the cross and say that blood shall cover me. And I just pray that for us tonight, Lord. I pray for those of us who have that to find ourselves in celebration of that in the next few minutes. And for those who don't, to come to you in this moment and say, I need you. I just need you, God. And so just before we go any further, just in the dorms that are watching, people that are peeking in, if you would just put your notes down for just a second here in this football stadium. Anybody tonight, you hear this and you say, um, I think I look at my life and I've been way too judgmental. I look at my life and I, and I tend to be a real dispenser of the law of God, the, the truth of God, the standards of God. I feel like the Bible sometimes coming out of me is nothing but a rule book of do's and don'ts. And tonight, I want to come to God and say, God, help me to be grace and truth and not just an advocate of truth. You know, by the way, that's you. If everybody looks at you and they say, man, this person loves to point out everybody else's faults. This person enjoys being the police officer. (laughs) This person leans on Jesus almost sounding out of their mouth like he's the behavior police. If that's you tonight, anybody here just... Will you just lift your hand and say, I struggle sometimes with that, that sense of legalism, that sense of, I, I think it's birthed out of a, a desire for the holiness of God, but I, I, I tend to sometimes have a very short leash of grace and a long, long extension of truth. If that's where you are, will you just lift your hand, anybody? 
okay? Just ask that the grace of God tonight would remind you that he wants you to receive both and, and, and to give both. Anybody here say, man, I, I tend to go the other way. I think it's well intended, but I, I'm just maybe a person who doesn't buy, even personality perhaps, is, want conflict or I just want people to not know, not think of us as, as Christians as, as condemning or as judgmental or as unforgiving. So a lot of times I, I just feel like I lack the courage to speak up and to tell the truth or to call someone to accountability. Or sometimes I just, it becomes licentious and I just, I struggle with maybe just showing what I think is grace, but it's actually maybe license. And that seems to be something that I, I just kind of fall into left on my own. If that's you, will you just lift your hand? Just come to the Lord and um, as you come to the Lord, just think about that. Pray about that. Just ask him, God, do a work in my life in that. I want grace and truth to me and I want grace and truth through me. Man. And last but not least, I want to say tonight, if you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus, you've never bend your knee at the foot of the cross, you can come tonight and say, Jesus, I know you're the son of God. I know that you lived a perfect life and then you came down. Uh, I mean, you came, I'm sorry, you, you came down and you lived a perfect life. And after living a perfect, sinless life, a righteous life, you died a sinner's death on the cross for me. And because you died for me, I come and I say, what you did is more than enough to save sinner me. And so I come and I receive everything that the cross offers. Uh, a real attitude and posture of I want forgiveness. By the way, you know you're not really understanding that when you expect and feel entitled to forgiveness. You know you receive it when you come and say, oh, I'm a, I'm a lowly sinner that could never earn what you've given me on the cross. And if that's you and you've never given your life to Christ, you just come to him and you just submit your life to him right now and just maybe say, Jesus, come and be my Lord, be my savior. I know you died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sins. I know after you died on the cross as the great substitution for me, the sacrificial lamb for me, you stood in the way of God's wrath for me that I deserve, eternal condemnation for me that I deserve. I, I know that that, and I receive that. And, and, and now I know that also that they take your body off the cross and they put you in a tomb. And when they go to check on that tomb a few days later, you weren't there because you rose from the grave and I just ask now for resurrection power. And I ask that you don't just bring me to the end of myself to death, but that you raise me to newness of life, that I would be a person that shows grace and truth in the way that I live and worship. Listen, if you've done that tonight, when we go into community groups tonight, I want you to share that with your community group leader so they can hug your neck, welcome you home and just begin to celebrate what God's done in your life, okay? Let's stand together. We're gonna just worship for a few more minutes and then um, I'll come and give us some closing thoughts before we uh, dismiss.
so don't sit, don't sit down. Uh, just a quick couple thoughts before we get out of here. I know that tonight again uh, seems a little more somber for us and uh, reflective for us. Know that in weeks to come, we're going to come in here. We've got uh, a lot of incredible things planned. We actually had a pretty massive opening for us planned uh, for this night and uh, just felt like it might be a little tone deaf for us to, to start the way that we originally planned. We're probably going to kick that into maybe next week or the week after, but um, I can't wait for us to come into this place and just go after the Lord. Uh, we had, um, I think, over a thousand people that were on the wait list. Actually, if you look up there, you see that whole entire upper deck? It was in scaffolding uh, this morning, and so those tickets were not available. And then the good folks at construction worked twice as hard when they found out we'd immediately sold out. And they worked and they took all those things out. Man, Dan Dieter and his team are amazing. And so then we, we told them last second that'll be open. And so we're going to still pack that out. And then we've got to figure out between now and next Wednesday uh, what we're going to do together. And, and whether we're going to like kick this back and do two of these. Or we're just going to do overflow or maybe just kind of take turns making sure we're together. Uh, we're just going to roll with this as, as this season progresses and see what God gives us. But um, again, thanks for being so great. You guys did a phenomenal job tonight coming in here, socially being distant, leaving your masks on. I think what you're doing in that is you're serving one another. And so um, it's not my natural tendency as well. So I, I, I keep finding myself taking it off and having to put it back on, but I'm hoping that I'll get more and more used to it and more and more committed. And, and so let's hold each other accountable in it. Don't beat somebody up when they're not doing it. Instead, show them grace and truth. Tell them the truth. Like, you should put this on, but then be gracious in the posture and the tone that you use. Two quick things, all right? Um, commuters, we're so glad that more and more of our commuters are part of this than ever before. It's not just campus community, it's like campus commuter community, more and more every week. And so our commuters tonight in Green Hall 1870A, uh, which is uh, directly behind the commuter lounge, they're having a little bit of a get together that will launch next week's community groups for commuters. And so if you wanna go up there, this will be a great night for you to meet some other commuters, find out what commuter community groups we have all over the city in apartment complexes and different things. If you wanna be a part of that, just go to that. I bet they've got food and good stuff for you, all right? So go be a part of that tonight. Um, our uh, app that we always take notes in crashed, all right? And um, I think just being the first day, honestly, I think it's our fault. We made everybody watch Combo, all right? And then like, you know, they just blew up. But since then they've been recouping. And by the way, uh, our folks at IT, led by John Gogger, they are phenomenal at what they do. They've been preparing for this moment. Let's thank them. Um, but it crashed, uh, and, and, and so we weren't able to tonight upload the notes that we always use, you know, for community groups that happen tonight at 10 o'clock. So they told me to tell you that you can text CC Notes, C C N O T E S, all right, CC Notes to 24502, and they'll send you the notes, okay? So you can, uh, you can text that and they'll send you the notes. I also wrote down that journal entry, that, that, that statement, all right? So I'll have them put that in there as well so you'll have that if you want it, uh, just, just so you'll have that for yourself. On your way out, everybody that's here, look, look at that entire upper deck, look at everybody, everybody looks so good, perfectly socially distant here, look at me. If you would, we've done all this work, you came in at an assigned gate, right, that was given to you, that's why we did the reservations. So do me a favor, if you would, don't huddle up now on your way out, all right? So be aware that people are gonna be leaving and as they leave, like, be socially distant, wait, be patient, so that we leave and we're continuing to, to just do this for one another and, and our family members that are back home and, and all the people that'll be affected in a good way when we practice these good, safe practices together, all right? Um, Last thing, we didn't get to have freshman incoming convo. We normally get, get that, and it's about 4,000 freshmen in combo and, and, and people that like transfer from Purdue here or transfer you know, from Harvard here. We actually have uh, somebody who transferred from Harvard. All right, so we, we, sometimes we, we get this freshman combo. We get this like new student combo, and we get to be together. And it got rained out. We were gonna be in this football stadium Last Friday, it got completely drenched. And so we did a digital format of it, but a lot of people didn't get to watch it because they just figured, oh, it's just canceled. And so what I wanted to, to do, since we are in here, uh, I, was just welcome all of our incoming freshmen and our transfer students that have come here. We're glad God's got you to be a part of this. Welcome, we love you, hear that. Come on, give it up for them. Come on, we're excited God's brought you here. Thank you, thank you for joining us. We're honored. 
Can't wait to get to know you. If you are an incoming freshman uh, or you're, you're you know, just a transfer student, I always, at that freshman combo, give my cell phone out. It actually is my cell phone, all right? So uh, I know you might not want it, but just in case, I, I want to be able to be, you know, uh, your pastor, and I want to be able to hear from you. And normally, normally it's something that I can defer to someone else. And so if it's a spiritual question or anything that I can do to serve you, or if there's a thought you really feel like in the trenches is happening, you want me to know so I can be praying or be an advocate for you. If you got questions about the bus route, if you got to complain about something, we know with the good folks that serve you and food and all that, don't put that in my box, you know, don't text that to me. But if, if you know, and I always keep it on at night so that if I, if I see something that is time sensitive, I'll wake up. So I don't want to wake up at like one o'clock in the morning with just, something you want that's not time urgent. But if, if so I trust you to have the maturity to, to, to use this and not abuse it. All right, if you would, those of you who want it. But my cell phone is obviously... And uh, we'll always have an RS or a community group leader come with you. I never meet with anybody alone. Uh, and so, so we, we always come in and 99% and of the time it's just getting to know each other or something. Be patient. Sometimes they load up until they get backed up a little bit. But the answer is always yes. And so if you want to meet, if you want to talk about something, if you, whatever, like, it, it will be grace and truth, by the way. So you might not like what you're hearing at the end of it. You, hopefully you will. But normally it becomes a really great opportunity for us to get together. And so... That's my cell phone. That's the email. And then uh, you can, you can uh, if you want to follow me on Instagram, I always check those, uh, you know, and, and, and look at messages and stuff like that. That's just one more way for us to keep up with one another. I, I tend to sometimes put out messages like tonight when that opened up, I just posted about that really quickly. And so it's a good way to get information as well as uh, just for you to get a peek into, I guess, my goofy 50 year old life. All right. So uh, it's uh, at David Nasser on uh, Instagram and Twitter and all that stuff. And I know most of you don't do Twitter, but I just wanted to say that. All right. All right. God bless you guys. If you would just uh, put your arm this way. We always just end with just a prayer of blessing. And um, I know some of y'all are like, are we going to do that song, Blessing? We are. All right, we're going to do it soon, all right, but uh, not tonight. Well, let me just bless you, all right? Father, I just pray um, for these men and these women who are here tonight, uh, just a blessing over their life. That God, the curse of sin and darkness and death has been removed from them so that they may be light. That Jesus, the light of the world, lives in them so that they may be light and that they would shine bright this week. I pray that God, what we talked about tonight would not just be celebrated, but submitted to in life. They would be exuders of grace. Tonight now, Lord, let it go further in this. Give us permission, God, to go further in this truth uh, as we go to our community groups. And so may the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you and may the Lord shine his radiant face upon you. I love you. Go with God. All right. Remember, stay socially distant on your way back. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week. Thank you. By the way, by the way, by the way, by the way, Friday's convocation guest will be Andy Stanley. So I just wanted to say that to you. So it's going to be awesome. God bless you guys. See you.